flood it's first. Wonderful yeah. To see it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. unfortunately yeah. real. Yeah. It's not yeah. theoretical. This afternoon, I looked again. I said, "Oh, we have more. That's fantastic." <laughs> so I'm Libby Bonesteel. I'm the superintendent of schools. Some of you I know quite well, and some of you I haven't seen before and met. So please take some time to come over and say hi later on. If I haven't met you as of yet. Um, we're going to be here for a little bit with our friends Truex Collins, and I'll let them introduce themselves as well as Andrew and our friends at Engineering Venture. Um, and today, the purpose of today is to set the context of why we're talking about facilities in this way and why we're looking at master plan kind of possibilities. Um, there's several factors, some very real and in our faces right now, and some imagining and dreaming for the future as well. Um, so, the boys from TreeX are going to talk us through that. I'll talk about some education trends. We'll talk about some climate resiliency pieces and mitigation and put it all together for you today. But it's also a time for you to ask questions. So, please feel free. We're a relatively small group. Please feel free to ask questions that you think your neighbors might have or you might have yourself um, so that we can all get it down. It is being videotaped by Orca. Thank you, Orca. And um, we'll have it up on, have this presentation up on our website as well if anybody asks you um, for more information. Sound good? Okay. Can we, can we, this isn't working. Is no, I can be the animal. Can you be the clicker? Yep, I can be the animal. Okay. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome. Uh, Dave Epstein, partner uh, at Trex Collins. With me is Cam Featherston Hall, senior associate and project manager. So we're we're the we co-lead the K through 12 team. Um, we do, you know, just a little bit of background about us. We do. Um, we're a firm of 35 people in Burlington, and we have a, a, a studio group of us who really focus on K through 12, uh, and are quite. Um, but we also do other kinds of educational projects as well. Can you do the next slide, please? Um, this is a book that we've written about school design called Digital Crayon, and if anybody would like a copy, just if you could give me a card or your name or an email, we can send you a PDF copy. Um, and I also want to introduce Kevin Warden with Engineering Ventures. Kevin is part of our team. Hi, uh, yeah, Kevin Warden, civil engineer. Engineering Ventures, we're out of Burlington and uh, have worked with David and Cam on many, many K-12 projects, also the Waterbury State Office Complex, pictured here after the renovation, pictured below after the July flooding, and happy to say it, it survived quite well with just a little bit of cleanup required. Okay. So we're going to talk about the um, process for the master plan, what we've done so far, what we're do, going to do moving forward. Um, here are the main drivers. When the flooding happened here in Montpelier, as everybody can remember quite well, I'm sure, and the city did that excellent job with the community forums um, across the rest of the summer there, uh, the schools kept coming up, and quite rightly so, but the schools kept coming up. This building, as most of you know, um, had about two million gallons of water in the basement and it was about eight inches away from where you're sitting now. So we had an eight inch variance, which is a little close for our call, <laughs> for, for sanity's sake. Um, so there's of course this, uh, this question of what about this building? It's sitting in a floodplain, even though it doesn't quite have the floodplain. Here, come on over. <laughs> Even though it's kind of it was raised a little bit, that you'll see a map, I'm sure David's got this map in the presentation, that this building is actually raised just slightly above the floodplain, and it's a little island in the middle of red. Um, however, eight inches is eight, is eight inches. So um, what are we gonna do with this building? What can we do to either mitigate and renovate to ensure that it's safe in the future for our students so it's learning isn't interrupted, or are there other options for us? The board started asking these questions, just like the city of Montpelier is asking those same questions. The city and the school district are two separate entities, so we need to do two separate processes around that. Um, and then there's other questions as well. 
That's a picture of our hallway in Union Elementary School, which if you're a parent of a Union Elementary uh, child, you have had two extra days of child in your world because of water main breaks near that building, which has never happened in my tenure in six years. Um, but it's happened twice so far this fall. It's an old building. It's a beautiful building. And it's an old building. So we're putting a lot of money into renovating some of those spaces and making it look quite beautiful. There's some pictures of that in the slideshow as well as the auditorium and things like that. But there's some pieces. There's enrollment situations going on where enrollment at Union Elementary is dropping. Not precipitously so, but it is dropping. Um, and so it's, that's a factor that is in play when we're thinking about our facilities usage. And then Union, of course, is not our only aging facility. Main Street Middle School is also quite an old building. And again, a beautiful building, but quite an old building. And there's some pieces at Main Street that make it difficult to secure the building, to use the building appropriately for our adolescents and, and all of those things that we want. So we're looking for um, these gentlemen to look at our buildings. What can we do with what we have? Are there possibilities for future um, that the board and the community may want to consider in the future without making any promises? And then there's also this idea of evolving pedagogy. That school is not the same as it was when all of us in this room went to it. Me as kids are in the gym now, so I can say that. When all of us went to school, it's quite different now. Um, and that's a question that we bring up here at Montpelier High School around can we do more flexible learning opportunities within a structure of a school that's quite traditional, that's meant for kids to sit in desks. Um, that may not be the type of education that we really want to provide for our kids moving forward because it may not be the type of thinking we need them to do going forward. Um, so all of these pieces are going into um, their work and their conversations with us in the community and from there building out a master plan for the future of something we can point to in the future when we're making decisions about our, our facilities and about you know, important budget concerns and where we want to go with the education of our students. So there it is. <laughs> that picture that still brings me a nightmare <laughs> when I see it. I have to take like a, a second to, to look at it. So um, we just went through most of that piece, uh, but that is a very telling picture with Montpelier High School right in the middle of, of that, um, that picture there. As I'm just going to pass by as most of us are in Montpelier. It's too painful. Yeah, exactly. I can't, I can't stare at you. Go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little overview of the process. We're right here at this dashed line. So we're, we're doing this workshop on setting the context, really like setting the table before we eat. Like what, what are, what's the state of the state? Um, and then we will have another, this other green is a visioning workshop. And that's really more of a blue sky uh, visioning workshop where we'll talk about what, what, it, what are the goals for education, the educational experience here. In, the, in this district. Um, in the meantime, we're building um, our, in the blue here, we're kind of building our knowledge base. We did tours of all the facilities. Andrew has provided us with some great reports. And we're, we're trying to, and, and part of this process here today is to get more information, to hear what the community has to say about what should be, you know, we think we have a good idea of what the driver should be, but we want to hear from you as well about other things that we're not thinking of um, or haven't thought of or mentioned. So we're doing uh, narratives on uh, building condition, on um, space needs, and also on climate resilience. And then in the yellow bar here, we'll develop some options, um, big planning options, big picture stuff, 30,000 feet. Um, and then we'll present that later in January at, a, at the third community workshop. Um, once we kind of, you know, we get the feedback from that workshop, then we'll, we have a cost estimator on our team who will start to put, um, we'll do a pricing set, and they'll start to put some numbers to it to give people an idea of like, well, here's three options. We'll, Oftentimes we'll present those and say, well, it's hard to decide what's the best option until we know what's the relative cost between them. So we'll have that. And then um, 
we'll then at the end, you know, we'll put that together and that'll be the report and there'll probably be another presentation to the board and to the public about what what the findings were. So that that's kind of the, the lay of the land and you know the the goal is to have it wrapped up this spring. And as you were talking, I forgot to introduce my right-hand man with facilities, Andrew LaRosa. If you haven't, if you don't know Andrew LaRosa, he is wonderful and did a, I just need to say with pictures of the flood, he was masterful in handling this building during the flooding. Um, so that's Andrew. When, when David referenced Andrew, I was like, oh, we haven't introduced him, which he hates, but that's all right. I have to embarrass him a little bit. <laughs> I would add just one quick thing. You know, to, to take away from tonight is this is really the beginning of the conversation, and, and you know, again, thanks for coming out. And now is the time to go back to the community and talk about what you heard here about the context, and and encourage people to come back and yourselves come back for the second one where we talk about visioning. And this is this is the time to have those community conversations and find out what your neighbors think and talk to them. All right, and that's another way of saying we, we don't have answers tonight, but we're really <laughs> looking forward to all your questions. Um, I guess the Henny Penny slide, this is all of the, uh, you know, uh, climate resiliency issues here. Uh, I don't profess to be an expert on all six of those, um, but it's something as a civil engineer that relates to the work we do. Um, Obviously, flooding is, is the elephant in the room, and um, as I mentioned with Waterbury State Campus, we have quite a bit of experience uh, with that. A lot of these kind of natural disasters are random, and they could happen anywhere. Uh, flooding is pretty predictable. I mean, we don't know when we'll get the rains like we've gotten, but we know when we get them, where it will flood, and that's because it's based on elevation. It's based on contours. Um, I think we have some exhibits a little further on to get into the specifics of this site and the other sites related to flooding, so I won't go into a lot of it now. Um, hurricane, earthquakes, we are in an earthquake zone that's centered around Montreal. We've probably all had that one or two experiences over our lifetime in Vermont where, you know, we're sitting on the couch and our feet are up on the coffee table and they start moving one way and whatever it is, but some kind of odd experience with seismic activity, that's happened. Um, and then um, the other items relate to certainly uh, location of school, facility, infrastructure, you mentioned, there'll be water lines breaking. Um, so <coughs> this is something obviously as you look at the schools you have and um, how to best keep providing educational and community services from those schools or consider alternative situations we want to look at it through the lens of these these items. I would, I would offer the continuity of service, you know, for, as, a, as a parent, <laughs> that if, if COVID taught me nothing else, it was how important the continuity of services for schools are for our community. Um, so that, that, hopefully that doesn't get underplayed. Uh, this is an image of the uh, 100, the 100 year floodplain is the blue. Uh, that's Union Elementary in the middle there, that U shaped building. Uh, and the, yep. the orange is the 500 year floodplain. Um, Kevin, do you want to talk about the planning around the yeah, 500 year sure. floodplain? Yeah, um, sure. You know, the, the towns uh, are, are responsible. There's kind of the regulations and then there's just good planning and policy and on the regulation side towns and cities are responsible for implementing FEMA's requirements around uh, flood mitigation and protection and the reason for that is because the town uh, has access to flood insurance and unless the town does implement it uh, they can have you know be at risk of losing their flood insurance through the federal government and so in order to implement it, you need to have a policy. Montpelier just updated theirs. It's a draft policy right now that's online. I think it was last week. Seven. Yeah, and um, some of the things that are at, were added we can talk about tonight, but the, the key takeaways are you have what's called a base flood or design flood elevation, and that's generally what's called the 100-year storm, and that doesn't mean it happens every 100 years, but it has a 1 in 100% chance of happening every year. And it's based on data that's 
probably is outdated as we're getting different uh, and, and more intense rain events. These maps were updated in 2013. Okay. These are the FEMA maps. So that's, yeah. they're 10 years old. It's just, just to... Current, they're 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah. And so the blue is that 100 year and um, the federal government requires that buildings have their lowest floor one foot above that at a minimum. Montpelier, similar to Waterbury, where we worked on the state campus, requires two feet above that base flood, base flood elevation. I don't have the floor data uh, on Union uh, or Main Street. I do. I can talk more specifically here at this site. The red is that 500 year, which means there's a 0.2 percent chance of it happening each year. Um, and for facilities, one of the new changes in the Montpelier regulations for critical facilities, and we should have a discussion around whether we think schools are critical facilities, obvious ones are police stations, fire stations, um, the Department of Public Safety in, in Waterbury right at their campus. Those are definitely uh, critical facilities, but I think the case could be made that a school could be considered a critical facility based on Montpelier's direct definition. Uh, for critical facilities, the floor level should be two feet above 500 year, that red, the lowest floor. I think the next slide shows Main Street, and again, the blue kind of nips at the edge of the site, and then the red comes right onto the site, and that's based on the elevations at the ground level, so the elevation of the parking lot, but you might have a building which has a basement, especially this, the historic buildings that are below those levels, and while the regulations may say that building's not in the floodplain, there may be some things to consider, because you know, when, when we worked on Waterbury, some of the buildings that were above the floodplain elevation were impacted because water came through tunnels and utility pipes into the lower levels, um, and that impacted buildings that would have otherwise not been impacted. Yeah? I, maybe I missed it, but did someone explain the dwindling resource that you uh, um, bullet that's been on each well, of Well, I think the, we're talking about warming climate, I think, you know, for example, um, do we need to air condition the buildings, right? As an example, as part of making this building resilient from an educational standpoint, dwindling resources, um, use of energy really is what it's talking about, is that, you know, should, should all of the buildings be net zero? Or, you know, should we be, is that a driver? Um, and then continuity of service is, is both the continuity of the operation of the schools because, you know, the flood happened in July. It took every minute up till when school started to get reopened. If it had happened on September 10th, school would have been out for two months. You know, it would have been a, it would have been a loss of continuity. Um, also, my understanding, and Andrew, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a, a lot of infrastructure services centered in this building that if this building went down, like data and phone, for example, the other schools would go down. So there's not resilience from that standpoint. So that, that word has double meaning. Sorry to jump in with questions. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like this might be outside of the your brief for this, but yeah. in terms of like one of the things that Montpelier doesn't have is a, like an area of refuge to, to go to. Is that you know is that being considered as the, in the continuity of services? Well, it's a good question. Is this building considered now like a fallout shelter or a this you in, know this what? In what this, <laughs> this in building as well as yeah. Well, we, but although we use Main Street Middle School during the flood, right? <laughs> well, for obvious reasons, because you need a boat. <laughs> Yeah. Libby, are we are we including Roxbury Elementary in the conversation? Yeah, we have a. We are, okay, these are just mostly around environmental sure. pieces. The next and, slide and is you Roxbury. Can see, um, okay. The situation in Roxbury. I wanted to set you up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. The uh, the situation in Roxbury in terms of floodplains and that kind of thing is is a different story. It's just a different area. I will say back to Main Street, one of the things um, to just think about as we're going through this study was, is that if 
the flood had influenced Main Street, there's an entire floor of school that is in the basement. So if this water were to get into Main Street, we wouldn't have had a basement to fill like we had here with that we lost some books and some wood and you know some chairs. Um, this would have been classrooms that we lost because that for where the gym is and the um, sustainability lab and art room and board room, <coughs> cafeteria, all of that is under grade. Essentially, you can see here the gym, which is right here. I don't know if you can see it, but I'll, I'll point it. Is in the 500 year floodplain. Yeah, building yeah. almost almost a scale. Can you go back to the Montpelier one? Because I think one thing that's uh, the high school rather. So this is the 500 year here, and this is the 100 year, and then the building is in is mostly in the 500 year, but there is a portion in the 100 year. So Montpelier, this. Kevin, you're going to have to help me with the yeah. floor elevations. Yep. Um, the floor elevation of... 525. It's 525. Plus or minus a couple of inches. And the 500 year flood is 525. 525. So if this is a critical facility, critical facility, and you could, you could look at the definition in the, in the regulations and one of the, the only, the category that would mean is like, if, if, it, if the building went down, there'd be a, a significant loss of socioeconomic activity, is the, would be the category it would fit under. Then the floor level here is two feet too low. So what that means is that you have to flood proof the building, which means make a bathtub out of the building. So that means you have to take the brick off and waterproof up the sides, put the brick back or something back, and then you have to put in floodgates at all the openings to keep the water out. So floods coming, get the floodgates out, put them all up, more or less, right? And um, then there's other issues with hydrostatic <coughs> pressure too, which it's a big intervention. I mean, it's suffice to say this is not like a simple, quick fix to make a building that was built in the 50s into a bathtub, essentially. Yeah, we, we did, um, it was a different solution to water rate, but if you've been to the new target in Lebanon, that's four feet below the floodplain, and, and we basically worked with FEMA to figure out how to do that there, and I want to say it was a million dollar you know, effort to, to flood through flood. <coughs> yes. I've got a question about how the flood water came in that I think is germane to the floodplain discussions. Um, and the endosaturation, epi-saturation, probably not everybody in the room is into that, but <laughs> basically with these sandy soils, the water table is coming up. So I wonder, did the water make it through the basement in sort of an endosaturation sort of way, or did the water come in where we got to a water level and it was maybe able to tip over and get into some access point. Basically, do we have a wet basement no matter how high that, that Typically, works? Typically, we do not have a wet basement. It's actually pretty dry down there. Okay. Uh, our best guess of where the water came from is we have a bulkhead down by the stage. Okay. I'm sure it breached there. And there are about five large compartments down that separate the building. This is the only portion of the building that's slab on grade. Otherwise, there's a six foot crawl space under the entire building. Okay. So the gym is an area, the stage is an area. And there are about three foot wide openings, bulkheads that you go through. So I think the uh, definitely the uh, bulkhead on the back side of the stage let water in. Also, it came through primarily penetrations that were in the building, water entrances, electrical entrances, things of that nature sure. that it penetrated through. And certainly, this is my guess, this is way out of my realm. I think it did come from above, because it's, it's a dirt floor down below. Mm -hmm. Because when we got here on Tuesday morning, it was five and a half feet or so deep. By Wednesday morning, it had gone down. So I think it probably <coughs> seeped back through. Um, and then we started pumping. So I think it was a combination of a lot of little okay. spots. Because I, somebody who owns a wet basement along the river, we didn't get flooded per se in our home, but we had water in our home. Yeah, so. and, it, and it is, like I say, it is typically dry down there. Though. Yeah, okay, great, thank you.
Yeah, so, I mean, another approach is, you know, the kind of the, the Holland approach where you have like barriers out further out to protect it. Is, is this a site there that's even amenable to something like that? Where you set up a perimeter? So, uh, I, I can say just briefly that. Did everybody hear the question? FEMA, FEMA the question is basically creating levy, levies around the perimeter of the building, whether they're berms or structures or whatnot. And FEMA would not allow that uh, as a remedy. Um, you don't, you're not required to store flood water in your building uh, on FEMA's behalf. Uh, you're welcome to keep that out of the building, but you can't take up area of the floodplain, um, which a levy would do um, to prevent um, flooding of that building, because it, what it does is it creates more issues downstream. So the, the short answer is no. Maybe if you did a whole tens of thousands of dollars of hydro, hydrologic studies, to demonstrate that the levees wouldn't have impact downstream. Um, and then a more nuanced answer is you can create a perimeter at the building, which is what we did at that target down in, in, um, in Lebanon. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned that these FEMA maps are 10 years old, but considered current. Is common expertise <laughs> thinking that those levels are correct? that those elevations are correct when we look at the climate change version of a 100 year and 500 year? I mean, we know that we've had floods of this level, and I know Irene was different than July 2023 here versus Waterbury versus, you know, wherever in Vermont, but we've had that twice in 10 years, 11 years. Um, it's a little more nuanced than that, but we, we do know we're getting more intense, longer duration rains, so they need they will be continually updated. I so think do what's you think the, the elevations should be lower or higher depending on how you look at it than what we're seeing here. Or is it more about the frequency with which we can expect That's a good question. It's more about the yeah. frequency, and it's more about tolerance for and, and you know risk tolerance, right? So that's what the required maps are. Your regulations refer to those elevations. Montpelier has said instead of one foot above the, the flood elevation, you, you need to be two feet above. So there's already some risk management built into those regulations. And then the, the real question will be, what does the community want to do? Does it want to meet the bare minimum of the regulations, or does it want to go beyond? So it's a little less about what should the maps be, and it's what, how should the community respond to what the maps are and what we think is coming in the future. Just sure. Quick, quick oh, go. Um, you talked about turning the building into a bathtub, but I think it's an anti-bathtub. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a boat, yeah. We're going to store all the water in the building. Interesting use of terms. How about an upside down butter dish? No. Um, there's a question here first and then here. Is, is there any conversation that is informing this particular conversation about the dams upstream? I think that's a conversation that's bigger than us. Do you mean the conditions of the dams? The upstream? conditions of the dam and the impact of those dams, not Wrightsville necessarily, but perhaps Cabot, maybe further up, upstream and the potential impact on this building what and the town. I know that the city and the state are, I mean, all of us have heard the stories on VBR and that kind of thing. So I know the city and the state are working on that. That's a little bit beyond this particular <coughs> study. Unless you, do you know anything about it? I don't know anymore. I was like, we got an engineer uh, in the That would have been my answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What Just was the question? Well, it, it's sort of a, a, a slightly different version of that, which is that question about there's all of these other sort of climate resiliency discussions that are happening at the city level. And so it's more of a process question. To what extent, Trex Collins, will you be trying to align this plan with maybe some of those other plans that are going on. For example, if there is some fairly serious um, mitigation discussion happening, I'm trying to orient myself, about essentially widening the bank of the river like right here. That it, what was that? Bailey Yeah, that would 
potentially have some pretty mitigating effects here that would probably totally impact the, the plan. So it's more of a process question, and um, timing's probably not our friend when it comes to this, I would imagine. Olivia, I can speak to that. Um, I want to emphasize that I'm not here in an official capacity. I am I'm on the, uh, the Resiliency Commission that was recently stood up. And I can say, again, I'm speaking as James. I'm not here as a spokesman for the commission. I want to be clear about that. Um, but the commission is, is uh, from my perspective, there to handle the, and ma'am, excuse me, the question was, Tom, next to you, who's um, to handle your, like, the connecting pieces, right? There, that this, it's, it's, as Libby said, there are entities that need to handle their own shop, but obviously they're all connected, and, and the commission is taking that broader look. It's, I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, so. If we're a designated critical facility, does that open up other kinds of funding for us for renovation or repair or new construction? I don't know who deems you a critical facility or you self-declare it. Um, I but <laughs> what? What? That's declared. Yeah, that's declared. <laughs> um, but that's a great question because it, if you could get a designation and maybe there's more federal money related to flood proofing, <coughs> that would be great. We want to do with those great questions so we don't have answers for it. Well, that's what this board is for. Mm -hmm. Is uh, and I've been remiss in writing yeah, them down. I appreciate <laughs> it. Tom, did you? So. Have yeah, I said I had a quick question about. Uh, the numbers. So you said 520 feet, 25 feet is the elevation for a 500 year flood? No, that's the elevation of this, of, of the floor above sea level. Yeah. So this what? this floor surface is 525.15 Yes, feet which is the same level above sea level 500 as year the 500 year flood. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, yes. My, my bad. No, I followed that part. What is the, just for the thoroughness of my notes, uh, do you know what the 100 year? It's roughly 523. Uh, 0.1 to 0.8. It's, you know, we're, we're not in one spot. We're along a river that has a slope. Sure. So 523. And what, and what, what was the flood we just had? Well, it was... Pretty it close was to that. <laughs> 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 we were 8 to, eight eight to a foot from uh, uh, reaching so, so call that 524. So this is this is yeah, really so cool. Can so you go back uh, to... <clears throat> so you see this map? See... This is 500, and right there is where the 100 starts. So go back. Can you go back? Keep going back. Look at this. This is the 500 year flood designation on the map. Right there is where the 100 starts, and this is all in the 100 year flood plain. It's just you can see the water's just the crown is showing. So it was really like a hundred year. I would Max say a the hundred year flood. What? I'd say a little higher. A little higher yeah. than yeah. yeah. I mean, if if the if the uh, one hundred year is roughly two feet below this floor, and you were eight to twelve inches below this floor, then we were higher than the one hundred year. We were basically the top step of the, the best. The best we can gauge is about to the top step of the uh, front entrance there. And you, if you look at this picture, uh, is it the auditorium that's the building closest? Yeah. You can see the loading docks. I see just brick here. I don't see the um, concrete foundation below that. And I believe the floor goes below that brick. It slows down. If we go to that FEMA map, you'll see that auditorium is shown in the floodplain, which means this entire building is in the 100-year floodplain, even if a corner of it touches. And that's fairly accurate. Um, because that floor in there is below it, 5 But it, did, it was dry? It, it sounds like it Yeah, which dry. was it? Andrew, there's a little water in the Union basement as well, right? There was water in the Union basement, like, but it was no real. Yeah, I think that was just bigger from, than what okay. we would normally get after that. But there was rain. people definitely kayaking down School Street. <laughs> the water, came, so it, the water I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Union. So the water came at relative to Main Street, it went right to the roundabout. Yeah. It was, that's where about it, where it tipped. And at Union, it went to the corner of the church, and what's that road that cuts across that? Saint, isn't Saint it St. Paul Street? Street? Well, yeah. Street's Loomis. Uh, it goes Loomis, and then there's the, Yeah, it got to St. Paul. It got to St. Paul, so yeah. it got to St. Paul Street. Yeah. Um, 
And, but no, I think the water that was in there was more just a matter of three weeks just, of just okay. saturating the ground. Yeah. Well, when we toured, there was a little water in there too. So it, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's an odd thing yeah. that school sits five feet above ground. There's always a little bit of water in. Maybe that pipe that burst the other day has been leaking for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. One thing that when I was saying we have to create a a, a boat or a bathtub <laughs> is you also have to fill in the whole basement, mm -hmm. right? You have to kick everything out of the basement. And make sure the boat doesn't float. Yeah, <laughs> and you, gotta, you, have to, you have to fill it in, and including the boiler room, which is all down, even lower than this floor. Um, so it's, it's not as simple as removing all the bread and water, right? uh, which is not simple at all. Yeah, sure, there's a question back there. Is there, in terms of, I think this is a, a related to the Waterbury campus, but it, it, and the overall plan looking forward, uh, thing is there, is there planning that then happens in terms of exterior facilities, baseball diamonds, parking lots, flood resiliency? season we're working on the field right now to look at whether we put clay back in softball field or do we use a baseball whether that was the weight of the material or was it the fact that we were at a pinch point so the water was moving faster we're not really sure so on, a, on a very immediate level we're definitely talking with FEMA about those do we oh I, I mean so the longer term design yeah. I can give you a specific illustration uh, from the Waterbury if we want yeah. to flip to that um, aerial view in the beginning. And um, specifically, there were 22 buildings between that brick uh, long row of buildings, historic building section, and the river. And someone asked about the dams. You know, those dams were put up after the Great Flood in 27. And either because of hubris or institutional memory loss, they built you know 22 buildings out towards the river, which were all badly damaged during Irene. So this process involved evaluating a lot of different things, but the end result was take the buildings out and put one building in. That building was in an area where we actually had to fill. I remember I said you couldn't fill to remove the capacity of the land to store water. The white building is on fill, which means we had to lower everything around. So those parking lots are designed to flood. You can see that there. You can see it there. And what I understand from the facility staff is it was a couple hours of cleaning up after, and they were ready to go. But more importantly, there's <coughs> fields out beyond those. And all of this impervious needed to have stormwater treatment to meet the regulations. And the stormwater division and many folks were really pushing hard for new innovative technologies, many of which include filtration and other systems, and we kind of held our ground and said we're going to use something different than that. We're not going to use filtration systems knowing that they would flood, so we just have very basic grass swales, uh, which still function, um, and they have a lot of length of grass swales out through those fields, um, but again, they were ready to go after July. Thank you. We, we will be looking at that in general. Yeah. So should we maybe move on to, uh, and we can do more questions at the end. Um, the next thing we want to just 
kind of give a brief overview of the facilities. Um, Andrew? Yeah, I'll make this very quick, just so, so folks who haven't been in the buildings or haven't been in all the buildings. Uh, the Roxbury Village School is a wood structure. It's been added on to the original two buildings, which was a one-room schoolhouse and, the, and the, what we refer to as the town hall. Classrooms that were added back in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, it's about 10,000 square feet. It's generally in very good condition. It's a wood structure, so it definitely needs continual maintenance. Um, on the on the, the exterior for sure as well as the interior, but it has been maintained over the years. Uh, the, probably the biggest changes that have happened in the last five years is uh, the DDC control system on the on the uh, mechanical systems has all been. It used to be we'd find out whether things were working or not depending on if we got a phone call from Tina when she showed up to work. But now Tom actually can look at the systems at four o'clock in the morning when he has his cup of coffee and make sure everything is working properly. So that's a huge addition of that, or uh, improvement that's happened down there. The other thing that has been a big improvement down there is um, the uh, heat pumps that we've put in all the classrooms and administrative offices. That, that project is complete and they're operating well. Um, and we actually kept that a relatively simple, we did not add those to the DDC, we just let them run, and then whether they can't keep up with DDC and the, and the rest of the mechanical systems, Kick in and that seems Did to work really for us? Direct digital control. Thank you. Oh, you don't, you don't know those two? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Picking up the last one. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, so electrical, this goes for all of our buildings. All of our buildings are net metered. All of the electrical that we use in our district is being generated off-site somewhere on a solar panel, on the solar panel. So that's, that's consistent for all of our buildings. Uh, number two, oil is what we heat the building with. Site-wise, uh, it gets damp in the, in the spring, but actually dries out pretty well, surprising, because it really is about as low as you get in Roxbury. Um, but that's the Roxbury Village School, we say about 10,000 square feet. Really? The latest statewide, statewide assessment that was just done called out some accessibility needs at the school that would need to be. Yeah, there's the front door. We, we, the, the public uses that building. Um, you know, COVID, it's, it's since COVID, it's not as often as they used to, but it's a but it's a it's a hub and it's used for town meeting day and things of that nature. So for accessibility, it's a dirt parking lot, but there is a sidewalk to the front door and then you come in. But you can't just close the town the town hall and open it up to the public for accessibility. You actually have to allow folks to go through the entire building. I would, I would just add from our perspective, it's a very quaint you know, uh, old old school, old school, literally, uh, village, small village school. It's it's kind of, it's kind of cool because it's a town hall and I think the original schoolhouse mm -hmm. uh, with a little wing that connects them. So, uh, very much the small village school model. Uh, there's 35 up there now. There's a picture of our auditorium. Everybody who went over that. It's going to be gorgeous. So that's uh, Union Elementary. Uh, that was built in 1939 uh, as an elementary school. Uh, the uh, big picture, big picture site-wise, we all know about the playground renovation um, and stormwater mitigation that took part as part of that. Some very cool, interesting things that were, were took place for that, but we won't go back over that. New roof was put on about uh, 10 years ago, so that's in great condition. The building itself is very well made, terrazzo floors, glazed block on the walls. Um, we, at this point, uh, for environmental concerns, the only real asbestos that's left, left in the building are the ceilings in the hallway, but otherwise, we just took out about two hundred, uh, no, about $100,000 worth of asbestos out of this room and the little gym this summer. So we, whenever we do a project, we take it out. Um, again, this building is, is heated off of district heat. Uh, so we do have boil the original, not the original, but we have older boilers that handle the shoulder season. Um, but district heat has been perfectly reliable. Uh, for that building. Tara, who's the head custodian of that building, has done an amazing job. Um, she is on top of it and she's crawling through every nook and cranny of that building and getting to know it really well. 
Um, yeah, that, this building is about 50,000 square feet. A basement of, that is, um, is, a, is a little, there's, there's water that runs through, but we've got some pumps and, and things of that nature. So, but fundamentally, the bones are very strong and very good in this building. The windows have always been a concern. We, we need to do that project, but the price of those windows are very, very expensive, and it's a matter of coordination, and COVID kind of throws for a loop, but we're not going to be able to use that since much longer. So. Mm -hmm. Um, some of, yeah, I could chime in. You know, so, some of the things all of the schools, um, the, the three Montpelier schools, is that, you know, we when we look at schools, one of the things we look at is safety and security, and all of the um, administration areas where the offices are are remote from the entry, and you know, common practice now is to have uh, be able to credential people as they're coming in the building, you know, in the airlock, uh, and then buzz them in. This building, you know, is one of these things where there's a lot of signage and the people are very diligent about making sure they intercept anybody who comes in the building. But, um, so that's a, that's a, a concern. The, when we talked with the principal, um, you know, she, she said, you know, there's really no uh, space for community events because the uh, seating, you know, the, the whereas the auditorium is beautiful, it's not a lot of seats. The gym is very small; it's very undersized. Um, so that was um, that was a comment of hers. Another comment was just a lack of flexibility. You know, it is a it's got great bones. You know, in terms of high ceilings, wide corridors, nice materials, but um, it's not a very flexible building. There's not a lot of you know operable partitions or uh, different ways it can be used or reconfigured. So um, those are just some comments about some of the things we're seeing so far in our, on our tour. I just want to chime in really quickly and say I think that building is an absolute gem. And it, what an incredible asset for the community. It's a beautiful building, very well designed, and but very much a, a product of its time. You know, when you go in the basement and you see the incredibly large coal hoppers um, <laughs> and the giant shoe, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you rem it makes you realize, yeah, this building was built 30, you know, 80 years ago for a different society, with different expectations of their students. You know, one of the things about, um, we were t when we talked about earthquakes, you know, I know everybody's focusing on flooding, but, you know, Vermont, and we haven't, we haven't looked at each site, so there's, there's general seismic activity in, a, in a, a region, and then you specifically look at a site to see what kind of soils there are, and which can indicate, you know, even, even further, because when the ground starts to shake, if you're on jelly, you know, it's, you're going to shake even more. So none of these buildings, as far as we know, have been upgraded for seismic. And so we just felt like, we know flooding is top of mind, but in terms of doing our due diligence, we want to we really got to like cover all the bases and make sure um, we don't flood proof the buildings and then there's an earthquake and we didn't do our job. So, um. so another, just, uh, she said, for the Union Elementary, it is not sprinkled. Speaking of continuity of uh, operation, that building is not sprinkled. Main Street is partial. Um, the build, this building was built in 1917. Um, the site we've gone through and improved the basketball court and things of that nature. The next piece will be the playground, which is part of ESSER funding. We'll see what comes of that. I mean, there's improvements that we need to make. Um, it's, and we're gonna, unfortunately, that, that playground piece is gonna be the buffer with inflation. We've got other ESSER projects that Libby's talked about over the years that sort of are more, I don't want to say more important, but they, they're, they're sooner in the queue, so, uh, but we'll, we'll definitely be making some improvements there that next summer. Uh, the roof on this building, again, is about, on the, on the original portion of the, the, the building is, again, about 10 years old in great condition. On the 80s edition, which is the basketball court and the music room, that, that wing, <laughs> That is original to the construction in 82. It's a built up roof, still is working well, but it's gotta be, we gotta put that on our radar because 
built up roofs are long lasting, but 40 years is still 40 years. Um, <coughs> windows, same concern. Those are the original <laughs> windows. They're gigantic, they're beautiful, they still operate, but they're leaky and, and breezy. Uh, and even more important, because we, we have relatively new boilers that can keep up with the heat, it's more the summertime. It's the sun coming through those that getting some glass in there that can reflect some of that uh, that light or not, not the light but the, the intensity of the sun would make a huge difference with regards to comfort and the most fun class. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Top floor of that building. Um, and we just I mean it's as part of the study looking at climate resiliency, you know, and uh, according to some sources we just had the hottest of July in a hundred thousand years. So it, it's a it's a point well taken. Those those rooms. And those hot days are in May now, like late May is when we have those super this hot days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's yeah. actually eking its way into the school year. Yeah. yeah, those those rooms definitely are that. Like I can I can see it happening. Yeah. It's not just us. Uh, brick construction, uh, masonry structure, infills in the walls. Uh, very sound building. Again, one of the biggest challenges is the basement, which when it was originally designed was a very low gymnasium and the cafeteria and uh, kitchen are now classrooms and, and cafeterias. And um, I actually have the least amount of information on the original building of any of the buildings for this one, which is unfortunate because there used to be an auditorium and a balcony in that building. Um, by it used to be the high school, school, right? It was originally built the, as the high, the high school. school yeah. right. uh, HVAC, some relatively new boilers. Again, that was done um, 10 years or so ago. Again, all the mechanical systems, air handling, when COVID came through, we were able to do an amazing job. There was an audible whoosh in these buildings that I had never heard when my son was in these buildings. And with Tara and Mickey in this building, again, an amazing job. Uh, they are, they're on top of things, and the, the mechanical systems in these buildings are running like they haven't in a long, long time. Um, so, you know, when we toured this building, some of the things we heard from the principal and um, from the uh, my notes on, on my phone here, um, the uh, the library. Is undersized. The there's a lot. They, so this building has a lot of spaces you expect in a school, like you know, an art room, a music room, a library. But they're all very undersized given the population and uh, the use. Um, there's no performing arts capability in the building. So there's no auditorium. There's no stage. Um, there's and really the only gathering space is the gym, as far as I we know. Um, you know, the cafeteria, the kitchen was cited as being particularly problematic in terms of size when we were walking through, um, and cafeteria as well. And of course, the site is very small. It's an urban site, so there's no, uh, there's no soccer pitch or baseball field or anything like that. We all know that. Um, but, and, and parking, uh, of course, is very limited as well. It's worth noting that this school built in 1917, you know, Woodrow Wilson was the president. You could buy a new Model T for um, this was built as a high school. It perhaps is the least uh, adapted to the kind of educational offerings that are being offered in middle schools because it's all corridor and classroom, you know. And these were, in 1917, the kids that were going to high school were, um, you know, high performers and it was, it wasn't every kid going to high school in 1917. And kids sat in rows and they learned. And we don't do that in middle school anymore. Teams teach uh, as a group. And the education is very different. So this is kind of the most kind of pushing the square through the red hole from, yeah, from my perspective. Yeah, you know, the, the concept for middle school is team teaching. It's considered a transitional educational uh, experience between you know being in a solitary classroom and then being in a departmental high school and so um, we'll show some slides later but you know they are teaching in teams 
and they're making do with the space they have, but there's no common area, let's say, to get a team together for morning meeting or for any kind of activities. In fact, there's no, it's just, they're basically using the classroom. Um, so it's not ideal. I mean, can, has it probably been like this for a long time? Is it working? Are the kids getting an effective education? Probably yes, or definitely yes, but um, is the building suited for the model of education that's being delivered? Probably not. I think it's this, this hinges on the sensitivity to kind of social and emotional learning as a component of 21st century education, where it's not just math and reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know? And a school that's all quarters or classrooms has no space for that social and emotional learning. So, and, it, and this is at a critical age for kids as they're blossoming, going through puberty, their networks are expanding, they're kind of moving out of that one classroom, my friends are in my class age into the bigger world. So that's, not to dwell on it too much, but that's. What about accessibility in this building? It's accessible through the gym entrance. Okay. So there's. And so for kids like in the, I, do, is there an elevator? Mm -hmm. Yes. There is. Okay. Yeah. I just never That's, have found it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's right inside that when you go in, okay. in the uh, gym entrance. That's another one that in the facilities report that, that we put out every year. Definitely know that that is from 1982 or so. And yeah. parts, it's definitely one of those pieces that when it breaks, we're buying parts on eBay. And, <laughs> and so. But your kid's safe, I promise. <laughs> They're in the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. <laughs> It, does, it feels like a, a warren a little bit, like a little bit of a hamster. Oh, yeah, it definitely yeah, is. Yeah. And, like, my daughter can navigate her way through it, but I've often thought about... Like, kids with accessibility issues, and if the building itself is daunting to them a little bit to get around. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a pre-war pre school. I mean, it was, like, the, yeah, it was this but World War I there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the high school, high school... Uh, We'll go to the site considerations after we talk about it, but, or after we go through the rest of the building. Uh, this was built in the early 50s. This addition was added in the 90s, uh, the library and then the four science classrooms above us. Um, brick and steel, this building is sprinkled. Uh, again, double loaded corridors, classrooms and, and hallways. Um, Windows were replaced, I believe it was the 90s when they got rid of the ribbon windows, but it might have been earlier, someone with a little more institutional knowledge. Early 2000s. Early, okay, yeah, so um, so they got rid of this, used to have big, long, beautiful ribbon windows, well, beautiful to a modernist, but beautiful uh, <laughs> windows that were taken out and, and put in, luckily, fortunately, good quality aluminum windows. Um, so, uh, Heated with uh, number two oil. All the three town, uh, buildings in town have 10,000 gallon tanks, double walled, monitored out in sight. Um, there is the only the only air conditioning in this building is in the administrative spaces. There's a little bit in the administrative spaces, otherwise, um, in some interior spaces, but no air conditioning. Um, it's tough to describe something you're seeing. In. <laughs> yeah. it. But uh, one of the things that all the buildings have benefited from has been, before my time, uh, a consistent, always, always adding a little something, always trying to do. Every year we try to do a few classrooms in every in every building, um, and, and, and keeping ahead of things. Uh, and this, I think we see the results here in this building and all the buildings really. The site is probably one of the most challenging pieces that Matt Link could probably speak to. Go to the next. There you go. Uh, it's in our athletic fields in that um, you know we try to keep people off the game field, which is in there in the track, so we can have it ready for for games, have it good, good shape for games. So we've got the front practice field. We've got the old mud lot that actually is turning into a better field than we ever would have hoped. We were hoping just to get it green, but. Uh, again, every year we aerate it more and add a little more soil and a little more fertilization, and it gets a little better every year. But our practice fields are not are not fabulous, but they're there. But we also have to accommodate the middle school teams, mm -hmm. and especially with the loss of the Dog River. Matt has done a good job 
of being able to accommodate and move things. And we've we've worked with this year. We worked with Onion River Soccer up at the college to get some teams playing up there. Um, next year is going to be a real challenge in that we want the mudlot field and the practice field, the two out front, to bounce back from the floods, which means staying off them for a year. So if that's going to be Matt's going to Matt Link, the athletic director, is going to have to do some juggling because. Obviously, the dog herd fields are not going to be back in, in shape next year to be used. Um, we use this, the outfield of the baseball field for <coughs> field hockey, which hasn't slowed them down at all. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then parking is definitely an issue. Uh, this is probably the, it's just going to get worse and worse as people get through their fall driver's ed courses and <laughs> start getting their licenses. And, um, so by the springtime, it's pretty tight uh, with your Spartan, so. I'll just add to that site layout-wise. I worked with Andrew when we were working on the track and looking at alternatives. And you know, if you, Roxbury, Main Street, Union School, all are nicely orthogonal with the streets. And I see this trend all over. Something happened in the 50s or 60s. And <laughs> said, we're going to put our school like at 40 two degrees to the main road and we're going to use up all the space and you can see just even though the school's done a great job of putting you know overlapping fields it's the, the location of the site is, is it, challenging and it might have been interesting in that we owned more land back then too yeah. so uh but those architects <laughs> uh just as a point of context the middle school is about fifty thousand square feet this building is about a hundred thousand so union and main street are about 50 each this is about hundred thousand so the roof here, one, one last piece, yeah, the roof ahead. here is, um, this is another piece that uh, noted in the facilities report and that we're going to move, we're going to have to keep moving further up the, the pecking orders. Uh, that roof is probably about mm, 30 years old. We put a silicone coating on it several years ago when we had the bond vote. The, the, the intent was to replace it, but the money did not work out. There was not enough money to do that, so we, what we did was a, a silicone coating that's actually worked pretty well. But at some, at some point, that original membrane is going to get too brittle that it's going to start, it's going to start to be a problem. But it's, it's working still, but something we just need to keep on the radar. Two things I wanted to mention was uh, one was sprinklers. Um, this building sprinkler, Main Street is not. It's, it's this what about Union? Union, Union uh, it's limited. So the codes are much uh, heavily lean towards sprinkling your building town in schools. Like, and a lot of times when we work on an old school, the code official is like, you know, you're grandfathered now, but the second you add like a 10 square feet to the building, we're going to make you sprinkler the whole thing. We even have one project where they're like, the next time you do a project in the building, we're going to make you sprinkler the whole building. Um, but. And it's expensive and it's invasive, but you also could, you know, when we talk about continuity and resilience, you could look at it from a protection of assets. You know, in fact, uh, well, in, in some countries, it's the insurance companies that require sprinkling, not the code officials, because they look at it as, you know, from an insurance standpoint. Um, so that's just, I just wanted to say that about sprinkling, because a lot of times people are like, oh, I hope they don't make us do it, but if you look at it in a, from a, a resilience standpoint, it really protected, you know, the, the schools are probably among, if not the greatest of the community's assets from a, you know, replacement value standpoint. And so, you know, is it, is it, uh, is that, protecting that asset could be a, become a priority. The other thing I wanted to mention was in terms of air conditioning and you know, the warming climate that we live in, um, the analogy that somebody uh, used to me was, they said, you know how turf fields extend our sports seasons? They said, air conditioning extends our learning season. Because on both in September and in May, we get more learning days in because kids aren't baking in the 90 degree heat in the room. And so I thought that was a great analogy. Um, in terms of the high school, you know, the district offices are in this building, and that, uh, I know there's been a, for a number of years, there's been an investigation about whether they should move out, and because um, 
it creates a, a space shortage within the building. Um, there's one conference room for the entire building. Um, there's no small group workspace. And um, an example is, you know, we were talking on our tour about the idea of creating a ninth grade team. You know, that's a, some high schools have continued the team model into ninth grade as a transition, um, but there's no team space here. Like you would just have to basically take a corridor and say, okay, you four classrooms, you're a team. Um, so it's similar um, discussion as when we talked about teaming in middle school. So Jim and Jill, okay. Just a constraint, so we're you know, thinking about possibilities of dreaming for the next yeah. meeting. Um, parking is obviously a concern. I look at that lot that the state owns there. I presume it's wholly owned by the state. Um, would it be part of this whole process to maybe enter in discussions with them about if we have greater parking needs, parking there, but also like if we needed some more room and if they don't have as many people using that lot because of teleworking, to expand our borders a little bit. Just don't know if that's a possibility or if it's just a hard line and we're constrained by that space. Well, Jason, you, you spoke with them directly, correct? <coughs> we're allowed to use that space. It's a public lot. So we tell students all the time that there's no spots there. Um, they could park there, they won't get ticketed, and in the non-winter snow months, they could walk diagonally across. And just kind of okay. So at least from a parking standpoint. From a parking standpoint. Not yeah. from a being on time to class standpoint. <laughs> sure. <laughs> not on time, but from a parking standpoint. Or not from adding more fields or right. expanding the track standpoint. But, yeah. Thanks. I'm wondering if we can speak to, we were talking about like changing pedagogy needs. One of the things that I hear a lot from schools, and, and I'm wondering if you can speak to it in, in these schools, is um, those need for one-on-one -on -one spaces with students, either for mental health support, uh, students on IEPs. It feels to me like our, our buildings are not flexible in that way because they're so traditional. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can Yeah, we have speak way more space at Union. It's not quite as concerning as Union. It is at Roxbury, um, and it is at Main Street and in this building. And that's actually one of the reasons, main reasons, actually, we would love, although with this budget situation we're in now, it probably isn't going to be a reality anytime soon to get district offices out of here. Mm -hmm. Because the, our small offices, while it takes up space, they are small offices, and teachers could use them it's a real challenge here when you get to a certain age you don't want to be seen one-on-one -on -one with your teacher with your teacher helping out necessarily um, in a way that you know a youngster might not think of that right and so the privacy needs of kids here in this building in particular and at Main Street are huge um, that's a major thing that we would add if we could if we if we ruled the world and didn't have to deal with budget constraints Jason do you want to add anything to that Jason's our high school principal if anybody doesn't know no, I think that was great. Okay. I would I would offer from a broader trend. You know, we we work with school districts all over the state, and one of the things that we have found, and this really confounds people, uh, because we'll we'll come in and we'll say we'll do a space needs analysis, and we'll, and we'll look at a school, and, and we'll look and we'll say based on the space needs of the, of the programs that you're running today. Today is not like building new programs, but what you have today, your building should be about 10 to 20 percent bigger. And people say, how can that be? We have fewer kids than we had 20 years ago. That makes no sense to me. But it's because 20 years ago when these buildings were renovated and added on to, we didn't have speech language and pathologists in the, in the school. We didn't have occupational therapy and physical therapy. We didn't have behavioral interventionists. We didn't have math and literacy coaches. We, you know, there, there are a host of support services that schools provide for the communities that are new since these physical plants were built in 1917, 1938, when they were expanded in the 60s and in the 90s. And, and it's, we have a lot of adults providing services that are much, it's in a much more space intensive way. And to say nothing of like the, just the changes in uh, pedagogy around kids don't all sit in neat rows anymore. You have hands-on learning, you have small group instruction, you have private places where kids who have sensory issues can get away. Like, 
So it's it's a different approach. It's a different set of needs than what we were, what we built for in the past. Correct me, Montpelier High is the only one who hasn't been tested for PCBs yet, right? Roxbury is the spring, right. and then I think we're next summer here. But Union Main, and Main Street were cleared. We're cleared. Well, before and we we're not next there, summer. Right. Okay. So we've talked a bit about evolving pedagogy, and I'm just looking at the clock, and I want to make sure everybody has a chance to, to pontificate and ask whatever questions you'd like to ask. Um, but it, I would be remiss to, to not be able to put a plug, jumping on what Cam just said, around our four pillars of um, theory of improvement here in the district, which are collaborative practices and collective FSP of our teachers, meaning our teachers are not by themselves anymore. You know, Tom was a wonderful biology teacher. He's working with Katie Chabot on a regular basis. And um, our union elementary grade level teams are working together collaboratively every single day because teaching kids is hard and we can't do it by ourselves. That, that lone person is no longer the model. So we're collaborating all the time. Um, another piece is high quality instruction for every single classroom is most definitely obviously our priority. And what does that look like now? You know, we want kids up moving, talking, and do we have the spaces we need to do that? Our third is a uh, timely system to intervene, remediate, and enrich, which goes along again with what Cam was saying. That's a whole host of educators when we're speaking of that, of interventionists and remediationists that, that we didn't, we've added so much in my six years as a superintendent to that area because we needed it. We were, we were very low in that when, when we started here six years ago. So um, we've, I don't know the exact size, I think we've quadrupled our intervention team since um, the beginning. And each year in the summer, I walk with the principals and we go through saying, where are we going to put them? <laughs> right, Jason? Andrew's moved four times. His office has moved four times in the last four years. Um, and he's going to have to move again because we have to move an electrical panel up to the room that he currently is in now. So. Um, with all of these good things come people uh, who are doing services for kids. And then the last one is a guaranteed and viable curriculum, of course, and what does that look like? How do we have the pedagogy to do that? Um, there's some challenges to our facilities in order to get those happening. We're making it happen. I don't want to paint a picture of bloom and gloom, doom and gloom, sorry. Um, we're making that happen. And there's still some needs that we could, you know, if we were dreaming pie in the sky, we would have some changes there, of course. I do have a, a PowerPoint. So what does the future look like? Way back before COVID, we started a Main Street Middle School Building Committee with our school board. Some of you, I don't think anybody was on it tonight. You weren't on it. Um, but Andrew and I were on that, and one of the one of the sessions I did a what does the future look like for education, and I kind of pulled that up today just to say is there anything in here that I want to like reiterate, um, and I'm not going to go through the whole slideshow, uh, and I don't even know if I can click it because of the sharing settings right now, but it is in this slideshow, and we'll, I'll put this up on our website if everybody wants to put it, but it, look at it. But it is really interesting to see pictures of what a plumber might have done in 1917 when Main Street Middle School versus what a plumber needs to do now. Um, and there's some dichotomies there. The fact that information used to double every 18 years, then five years, and now it's 18 months information doubles. You know, So what kind of education do we need to provide for students to be able to flourish in the world that they're going to be moving into, um, that PowerPoint addresses that, or, or makes us think in that way. So when we're dreaming big for the future, maybe that's a good one to kick us off with next time right. to start yeah. off our visioning, but I don't want to take the time to do it now. Right. Well, this is a, this, that's a perfect segue. Um, and this is, this is a teaser here about Oops. This is a teaser here about visioning workshops. So our approach is whole child design. Um, we believe that just like schools are trying to address the needs of the whole child, so should school design. And we've, and we've broken that into three categories, wellness, learning, and engagement, which, you know, it's kind of mind, body, spirit, not quite in that order. but. And, we, and you'll see that, and in, in one of the things is, and that Cam uh, alluded to earlier is that most of these schools were designed for 
uh, mind and body, but not social and emotional uh, learning and growth. So we're going to show a couple of pictures of some projects just to kind of highlight what we mean by that. Uh, you go to the next slide. So um, this is the Winooski project. So these are not like magazine um, pictures. This is Winooski project. Um, catering to wellness, you know, not just like get in the building, get your credential, get to class. This is a, a full uh, school-based health clinic. There's a, a doctor's uh, office, there's a dental office, there's a I mean, this traditional sick bay, there's two nurses, there's a waiting area. It's like, it's like going into a doctor's office. And they felt that in their community, uh, kids weren't ready to learn. They were coming with uh, toothaches, medical issues because of the language barrier, because there's a lot of refugees. Um, they were really struggling to access healthcare. And so the school said, we will provide healthcare because readiness to learn is so important. Um, there's a cafe in the lobby, so kids can come in. And, and not just kids, but staff, parents, community, it welcomes them in. Um, and then this is a, a necessity store. They have a pantry, a food pantry, and they have uh, around, you can see the, the coolers, and then around the corner is clothes, so like um, boots, gloves, um, you know, all kinds of winter gear this time of year. I don't know about the summer. So the idea was that there was an equity piece here that you know kids who needed this shouldn't feel stigmatized and have to go into the back closet and say, "Excuse me, can I have? Uh, I don't have a jacket." Provide more of a retail environment for those kids. And another another piece is you know they have a, a huge uh, number of languages spoken there. So we we really were challenged by how do we provide. Um, a way for everybody to find their way around. So we we did a whole exercise with the students about um, what kind of iconic iconography would help them understand what these things were. And it was really funny because for the cafeteria we showed a plate and a fork and a knife, and the kids were like, "No, a bowl with chopsticks <laughs> <laughs> was more appropriate." And that's what it ended up being. Next slide. Um, so this is, we talked uh, earlier about team-based learning and what kind of spaces support that. And this is the middle school uh, common area in their team. So you've got uh, classrooms around. We have, we pop the roof up. This is a, a new addition to get natural light into the center of the space. And then this is the science room. And the science and the light can go all the way into the science room, even though it's a varied space. because. You know, one of the things when we do, we're going to do at the visioning uh, workshop is we're going to work uh, to develop what we call guiding principles. And we do this on all of our planning projects. And these are the, what are, what are the important things we've got to get right in terms of school planning for this district? What are your values? What do you value most? Is it sustainability? Is it natural light? Is it fresh air ventilation? Is it team-based learning? Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll use the whole child framework to develop those guiding principles, or at least the, the, we'll develop the groundwork for those guiding principles. Um, one of the things in this project, they, they were, natural light was so important because they had had a school with so many buried spaces. And so it was a real driver of all planning and design was to make sure that, because you know, it's a wellness issue, it's also a learning issue. There are studies that show that kids learn um, more effective learning spaces when they have access to natural light. Go to the next one. Um, engagement, you know, collaborative social learning spaces, community spaces. Um, this was their existing 1950, what was it, Ken? 1957. 57. Very similar to this one. Very similar to this. We took out four classrooms created this really engaging social hub. Um, but it's not just a social hub, because you know learning happens everywhere now. 
right? I mean, you're not confined to your desk listening to a teacher. You're on your computer. You're talking with your colleagues. Um, up above, there's small seminar rooms that are all glassed in. So if you're doing group work, you can do that in a non-disruptive way. So the versioning workshop is going to be a very blue sky opportunity to think big and think about what's really important uh, for Montpelier schools, or Montpelier and Roxbury schools. Next slide. Um, this is a project, this is at Mount Abe uh, renovation. Um, and the drive, the initial driver was security. So as I was saying earlier, you know, here the, the admin and the credentialing area is remote from the entry. Here we created the second floor area built this vestibule underneath and you can see the transaction window here so creating you know and, and that's that's the real sleight of hand with design is how do you create a secure yet welcoming entry right because you don't want it to look like a prison you want it to feel like and and so but they also here we call this the business <coughs> bar this is a, a table that has uh, where kids can plug in and charge they serve refreshments and uh, stuff here, and then they have this big video uh, display where they can, they have different events all day long and places to sit. And up here, these are the mountains, the Mount Abe, the range that the Mount Abe, um, Mount Abraham, the, the mountain is in. Next slide. This is another view of the lobby. Um, so the idea here is just you know, welcome community space. This is the the living room. This is your this is how, you know, I always say when you come into the lobby of a school, it should tell you everything you need to know about that school, its values. Um, some schools, we, when we walked into this originally, all there was was sports trophies. And I said, if I didn't know better, I would say all you really care about is sports. And they went, no, that's not true, that's not true. I said, well, let's think about what do, what should uh, this lobby say? Because, you know, buildings speak. And they, they, you know, some buildings you look at and they say, "Come on in, you're welcome. This is a this is a place of learning." Other buildings are look like fortresses, and you know, so that's a question we always ask: is what do you want your buildings to say to the you know to the people who work here, the people who visit here? So, um, and then finally, this was a, a in East Montpelier. This was the library, this was the reading nook, the read aloud area. You know, bathed in natural light, views to the exterior, fun colors, very, very kid friendly. Um, so all these things, this one I was sort of the summary slide of wellness, learning, engagement, all coming together uh, to create spaces that support the needs of the whole child. So we're gonna talk more about that at the visioning workshop, but um, I, I think it's worth thinking about between now and then. I hope you come back about you know, looking at these images, look, thinking about these ideas. What are the opportunities here uh, in this district? Hey, Dave. None of those are new builds, as, right? Some of them None are addition. Of, there's some additions. There's but some additions that were these people all the other ones are renovations. Yeah. To existing buildings. Yeah, they're all, they're all local schools, too. Yeah. I mean, these are. The yeah. communities that are doing this kind of work. So, sure. Um, I have two questions. One is, are you going to be, or have you already talked with the teachers themselves about what they currently do to make things work and what they, what you know, what their blue sky ideas are, or would the next one of these be the place for teachers to show yeah. up and share their ideas? Great question. So. What we like to do is have a cross-section of the community. So administration, teachers, students, if, if we can get parents, um, community members. And what we do is we, we, we have tables, we'll probably do it here, and have tables like this. And we make sure that every table is a mixture, a cross-section, so you don't have you know, all the voices of one group talking one way. And so it's a really engaging uh, conversation at, at each table as we work through this. So that's one way we can get um, teachers' input. But, you know, this this is a very high-level master plan, so there's a limit to how 
deep we can drill into, like we can't talk to every teacher or teachers in every school. We, are, we have did the tours with the um, building principals and we'll get more information um, as time goes on, but hopefully we get some teachers here for the, uh, for the vision. Yeah, it seems important to me for us to hear the people who are in yeah. the classroom every single day. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and my, se my second question is, those, mo those most recent slides you showed us were stunning. Absolutely stunning. Oh, great. Thank and I'm also thinking about, like, what's the must-dos and what's the nice-to-dos? Because we won't, I, I can't imagine that we would be able to afford well, all of the nice-to-dos. Is there a way that we would be able to have it I don't know, tiered or prioritized in some well, way? Well, you know, this, this master plan is going to be very, like I said, very big picture. So we're going to have, like, you know, <coughs> big planning ideas, like build a new high school on this site, right? Renovate this high school and, and you know. Make it an arc. Make it a bathtub. Make it an arc, <laughs> right. Um, build a new school on another site. Or, you know, it's like big, like, okay block plan, you know, like idea planning. So we won't be getting into like, you know, do you take down, you know, like we're not going to to that level of design where what colors or, you know, can we afford skylights or not skylights? So, um, but within that context of this study, you know, I encourage people to think <coughs> freely about, you know, because this is the time to let you, you know, um, we always say, you know, our approach is head in the clouds, feet on the ground, right? You want to, want to think big, but you, you want to be grounded also okay. in, in terms of what's possible. I think there's a question back here. Yeah, um, one quick comment. I think it's a lot to ask our teachers to come to an evening session like this, and so I hope that there'll be another vehicle to gather that feedback, because sure. I think it's really important to Mia. Um, and my other question is, I mean, I think that we probably would not be here doing this had it not been for the flood. Um, so you had mentioned the state complex and a target in New Hampshire. I'm curious about other flood mitigation projects that Truex Collins may have done. Um, and if there are not school flood mitigation projects that you have done, do you know of other schools we, so we that have, have had done any projects like this? Flood mitigation projects. Uh, engineer, this is, and which is why we brought Engineering Ventures on, who's done a few. Um, Schools did not do the state complex. No, we did not do the state complex. That was a different architect that Engineering Ventures worked for. So, um, you know, we're we're learning also, but we have our, our resident expert. So, you know, so how architect? You know, we. Architects, we know enough to be dangerous about some things, and then we bring in uh, okay. our experts for, for the rest. And every group that replied to our RFP, that was how it worked. There was mm -hmm. there's an architecture firm and there's an engineering firm that partner in this in the conversation. Do you mind if I ask if you're the engineering half of the duo? Have you worked on other flood mitigation projects uh, for schools? We've worked on other flood mitigation projects. Uh, one that comes to mind is the Burnham Hall in Lincoln that you know flooded during the 90s and came up with a solution. And during Irene, the water was up above their lower level, and they had the flood gates in and you know some infrastructure inside, and it all worked great. And it's now on like a FEMA website. It's like here's how to do it. Um, we worked at a school. It wasn't a school. It was a publishers office in, in distribution of school school um, publications in, I think, Littleton, New Hampshire. I can't think of a school that we've worked on. I'm trying to think of schools that are in the floodplain in Vermont. Um, it's Montpelier. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our, schools, our schools came through the flood, yeah. like, statewide, really, really Yeah. I, yeah like, that, even and, in our really yeah. heavily impacted communities, yeah. And this the high school is the exception, even though it, you know, it, we were the most damaged. You, were, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't Absolutely. Really had any calls from, from other school districts after July. Um, no, schools have been built up high and outside of the downtowns. Well, it's it's, it's really interesting because right. we're we've done 
many master plans, this is the first one where environmental resilience has been in the RFP, like, we want you to look at this. So, and I think there's going to be more and more of these, quite honestly, you know, um, because I, whether it's floods or earthquakes or, you know, global warming, um, keeping these buildings operating and, and effective as places of learning is, is going to be a challenge. Um, Sure. So when you when you started off this talk, you were kind of you know cautioned about the cost of some things, like the cost of making a bathtub and yeah. you know the, the hydrological studies. Just in, in perspective, how, how expensive was the remediation to the to like to the, to the school after a flood? Like where's your like What's our number at now, Andrew? Um, drum roll. So we had very good insurance. I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> How's the insurance rate? Zero. That's what I want to know. Visbit did a great job. While yeah. Visbit, while I was over at the middle, uh, the handing out coffee and donuts over at the middle school, Visbit was already on the phone saying, "We got people heading to high school." I'm like, "We're fine." I looked at the cameras. We're fine. He said, "No, you're not." Um, <laughs> as a, as just what the last I heard for pumping and drying the basement and pumping. So what they did to to get the water out of the building is they pumped. They pumped water out. They then pumped hot air into the basement, drew it out at the two far ends, and then they pumped air conditioning into this. They positively pressured this floor and the upper floor with air conditioning for seven weeks. That was million to a million and a half dollars for that for that piece, just that piece alone. So, the, so it seems like it's pretty cheap insurance to, to just in terms of like. Like all the all the efforts for you know moving forward with the resilient plan, even if this turning this into a bathtub can pay for itself within the, within the first great flood again. <laughs> and then just as a, just as a follow up to that, then on the exterior of the building, so far we are at about uh, we're about two hundred thousand. FEMA is going to pick up all but twelve and a half percent of that, um, and then anything we build back better according to FEMA, they will just match what we spent on the disaster. As I understand it, they'll, they'll match us up to about 1.2 million, but we have to pick up 12.5% of whatever that is we decide to do. And we have talked a little bit about what some of those measures are going to be. Uh, Tom Allen's got some we Tom and I and, and Kevin have talked a little bit about it, about you know, making the boiler. Basically, there's nothing under the school other than the boiler. Like, we make that the Alamo. Like, we spend a lot of money on that. And if the rest of the dirt gets wet next time, the dirt gets wet. But we're still working through that. We've got some time. And, and like I said, I've already talked, about, talked to Kevin about doing that walkthrough to really flesh out some of those ideas. I'm wondering now, this question about FEMA homeowners, they pay once. But what about this location at school? That is a very good question. So isn't the city running into that with Dog River? I don't know. I don't know that either. Uh, we haven't gotten to those conversations of what happens the next time. I hope. That should go in the board, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I don't want to speak to it because I don't know. We haven't gotten to that. <coughs> Andrew, I'm just curious about all the other buildings and structures, like the greenhouse and other spaces. How did they do? They survived well. They survived well. The water went through the greenhouses. Tom, the... the water never touched the main greenhouse. That was an island. Yeah, so other, like, the building, the chickens, and the greenhouse stayed dry. The, the hoop house, there was a current through there, and the gardens were flooded. Yeah. But the main that, greenhouse was, the was an island. It was high enough. I think it's an interesting question, you know, the cost to mitigate this past flood. What was it? You know, what's, what's the kind of... What are, you, what are you working against, right? What's that cost to clean up? But, you know, that's it's kind of a crapshoot, right? Because when we get seven to nine inches in the communities around here of rain, what happens if it's eight to 10 inches of rain? You know, we're within feet of overtopping Wrightsville Reservoir. What if that overtops, you know, and you get two more inches of rain in the, in the Woodbury uh, Valley, you know, uh, or the Worcester Valley? Um, these, are, these, are, these are the reasons that the the regulations and prudent planners suggest that you go a couple feet above 
the 500 year because in terms of the value of the asset, I mean, I think I looked at what the cost, if you think about the, uh, the cost of a tuition for a student per year and how many students are in the building and what that opportunity loss cost would be for students not in this building, it's like $35,000 a day. So if you had to provide space for the, for the students, is that what you would pay? I don't know, but it's, a, it's as good a guess as any. Um, so, and you can't do remote learning is my understanding. Nope. Yeah, Agency exactly of Education. It kind of gets at the heart of the issue, right? What does prudent planning, and I think the reason we're having this meeting is to get the community to start talking about this issue. What constitutes project, prudent planning? Because the master plan is going to be those the, the seasoning that you sprinkle on all the other projects that get to the level of granularity that I'm sorry the lady who left Me. was asking about. Um, you know, this is going to set the table for those projects that follow. And what are the what are the conditions and circumstances around how those are planned and executed? Does, it, does that make sense? Just one quick comment is, um, it might be the elephant in the room, but the community conversation is still very, very much on the merger of Montpelier with U32. Um, so that's, that's something that, that's a conversation that really needs to be addressed and managed before you will be able to, I think, really move forward on any of this. This, is a fa this was a fascinating presentation. It was really great, and I really appreciate it. But that conversation is alive and well here. Um, well, so, we're, and we're very aware of that, and it's, um, I, you know, we're, all of these things, you know, like, what are the conversations about the merger, what are the conversations about, you know, big flood mitigation measures, you know, with dams and stuff, we're, yeah. we're going to be tracking and keeping our ears to the ground, but we also, um, you know, have to proceed sort of as if that's not going to happen, because that could take years, and um, the school district needs a strategy in the meantime. Yeah, master plans can be redone. I mean, that if something changes in five years and the schools merge, then a master sh there should be another master planning effort. You know, um, I think it's worth noting just really quick, Jill, that even if that was to come to pass tomorrow, the school districts merge. Both school districts need every square foot of school that they have. You know, there's not like a spare school created by the merger of those two districts based on very preliminary looks at uh, the size of the schools that you have, the populations that are available, and, what, and, and where the enrollment is. It's not like enrollment's going off of a cliff and all of a sudden, oh, we, we don't need this 100,000 square feet, so problem solved. You know, we'll make it a we make it a sports complex. That it wouldn't, we, you would still need a building either on this site or somewhere else, mm -hmm. even if that merger happened. My, my point being, and I get it, um, is does the town get it? And the, and the other <laughs> point is if, if, if you move forward with any of this that requires a vote, it won't matter if that question is not satisfied in the community's mind. Right. Because they won't, they won't vote for any of this. Yeah, and this, is, this process could eventually lead to a vote of, or a you know, bond or something like down the road. This, but this is, this is a master plan. So this is like a, you know, a, a, here, you know, a, a, a series of principles and ideas about a recommendation about the best way for the district to proceed with, you know, addressing climate resilience, addressing aging facilities, addressing uh, <coughs> enrollment um, projections, and and the evolving pedagogy. Those four drivers. So there's basically, given all those factors and what's happening, you know, in general, what's the best strategic direction for? And because the question is, you know, what what always happens with these old these buildings that are older, you know, it's a valuable asset, but like, um, you know, the community's going to have to ask themselves, okay, to flood, you know, proof this building is going to, let's say, cost five million dollars, right? And then you still end up with this island surrounded by water. Maybe we build a, a bridge over to Memorial Drive, but like, is that? 
is that worth, is it worth the investment, right? It, does it make sense to invest in a new facility that's not here because it's just going to keep happening? And so those are the, those are the kind of questions really we're going to try and grapple with and hopefully have some answers. Yeah. And what, so that last example you gave was really interesting, I think, because like some of your examples are, are fascinating about looking within a school, within the building. But then to say, how does this fit into the entire community is a different level. And it's not necessarily 30,000 feet. It could be at 100 feet, but it's more um, interdisciplinary or more cross-institutional or whatever the right word would be. So uh, you were talking about the, the, the commission seems like that information would be important sooner than later in the formation of a plan. Yeah, and like I said, we will definitely keep our ears to the ground and make sure we're informed about what what's going on. But I think luckily for us we now know our good friend Jamie Ray back there is part yeah. of the commission. So that's yeah. good. Yeah, the other that's thing and I've heard David and Cam say this is if you knew what the answer was, you know, you wouldn't need us to, and you wouldn't need this process. And I go right. back to the water area example. Uh, on that project, we were asked to look at you know state offices in a green field somewhere, or state offices in another place in water area, and state offices as it ended up. And I don't think anyone thought that tearing down 22 buildings and building a brand new one at a certain elevation was the answer at the beginning of that process. So there may be a solution here that none of us has thought of yet. You know, and it takes takes into account not just flooding and physical things, but the needs of the community, of course. Yeah, yeah we don't come to this yeah. with a predisposition. No, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back here. Does, does your, it seems like maybe the planning goes in this direction, but I just want to, does it account for, because when we talk about where is the, where are these facilities, um, the vital importance of having schools as a central place in a community, Wa walkable for as many students as possible. You know, the talk of moving things starts to really discount the value in a town like Montpelier of having Union where it is, this where it is, Main Street where it is, what that means physically, psychologically, and everything else in the community, let alone if we're talking about climate change and climate resiliency, walkability is the future, right? So, I, so, I'm, I'm, so I guess my, it's a question to you. Is, do those considerations enter into the type of plan that you all are doing? Oh, I could absolutely. see, yeah. yeah absolutely. And I think what my David was talking earlier about what the community values, you know, mm -hmm. that piece would probably come, I would imagine, oh, yeah. knowing our community, that that piece would come to the top, and that's important to know, right? It's important for the school board to know, and it's important for um, future boards and future community members to know as well. Okay. Um, just a constraints question since I'm not an engineer and I don't know what could be possible, but are all of our buildings as tall as they could possibly be? <laughs> or, or just, just, you know, just, mm -hmm. if we're talking pie in the sky and just up. throwing stuff out and we'll be visioning at the next meeting, or are there some that structurally could handle other spaces being added on top of them? Good question. <laughs> it's all it's all I heard it's our expert not answer that question. <laughs> can, can, can I ask a follow-up <laughs> related question to that? And I, this, and I mean it seriously, because I don't know if this is like an engineering kind of thing that's like ended in the 40s because it was just kind of crazy and crazy expensive, but you know, you see the historic photos of very large buildings being elevated, rotated, moved, etc. Like, <laughs> are those... You know, just down the road in Barry, I worked one of the first projects in engineering ventures I worked on was the, the old Jones Brothers building, which is now the Barry Granite Museum. And um, that was a huge building that we lifted four feet uh, to, to pull that out of the floodplain. And Cam, we were, we were doing a little preparation for this, and he had some videos of massive buildings being rotated and moved. Yeah. Anything's possible. You know, yeah, we could, just, we, we could just pick this building up and 
Tell us where I you want the it. Question that it, like versus turning it into a bathtub, which you know, what's what's the cost of right. one versus the other? Oh, that's right. A, that's a great question. We yeah. don't need to get a cost estimate. We have, we'll do cost estimating at some point. Yeah. That's one of the options. So there's some other questions, uh, Rue, and then Jill. Um, with two quick questions. Where, is it worth putting, like, is this a, should this be an area of refuge or a our school be an area of refuge mm -hmm. with putting on there? Yeah. And then in terms Will of. Can you speak louder, please, because it's hard to hear. Yeah. Them. And then the other question should is. Should this school be an area of refuge? This was the first comment. Yeah. The sec second question is, goes back to the, you know, kind of the evocative slides you showed at the, you know, at the end. And you're just kind of curious if those. You, are those some things you need to sell to the community? Because I know like that, that that very competitive employees. That's how we're designing workplaces for because they value the like, people going into the workplace value that, but they also value that as a as a value generator because it's an opportunity to exchange ideas and meet mm -hmm. people. So you know it's not it's less of like just a student amenity, but right. but like it's a, it's a it's business. A, yeah. It's a business thing, and they're. You know, if the school's preparing them for their school environment, is that like, is that a harder sell because for people who, like communities are who are used to the desks and rows? Yes, it's a harder sell. It's, it, I think it's a harder sell because we're talking about a school building. Mm -hmm. If it worked for me, why change it? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's constantly a a thought. And and quite honestly, if we're talking about building construction with schools, I think staff probably is an afterthought. You know, students are the are the forefront of any kind of construction project. Or when you think about schools, right? Adults aren't the people who you're thinking about. I think there's some intangible benefits to some of this kind of work too. Like, you know, when you're when you're all buildings need renovation, you know, as they age. That's just a fact of life. And if you take the opportunity to do those renovations skillfully and with purpose, it doesn't actually cost that much more to, to do good design. Because, and you know, we're, we're architects, and yeah, we're kind of expensive, but we're far less <laughs> expensive than co contractors. Um, and that's not a knock on contractors. They just have a lot of things they have to get done, and they're responsible for building something that's going to stand up and stand the test of time. Um, and so it doesn't cost very much. Uh, more to make it beautiful and make it very, very functional and do those explorations to make the space worthwhile. Because you already have to renovate um, as part of the course of ownership. So that, that's, that's one thing. Um, and you know, it's worth noting that these, these are local projects and they're delivered at very competitive prices. They look really great, but it's, um, it's partially because we have such low expectations. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, you know, as a culture, as a, as a society, um, and I think part of what we you know what we need to do is we need to challenge those low expectations. Mm -hmm. it seems like so great. Sorry, yeah. with some creative design that, and some thought that, that you can do exciting things at at the same or low, less cost than you know, at, than at least comparable cost. Yeah. So, I know Julia. Yeah. No, go ahead. And I, you. All right. So, <laughs> so I was just it, more of a comment. So um, I think it's awesome that you are doing this master planning because there are a wide variety of funding, potential funding opportunities that are available at the federal level that are potentially available as like FEMA hazard mitigation. Um, it just, it's like an absolute alphabet soup right now. But if you have no master plan, you have no ability to take advantage when the opportunities present themselves. And the vast majority of our school districts do not have a vision and a master plan for where they want to go. So even if funding became available, to Cam's point, what you get is a lot of small scale, kind of generally mediocre upgrades to schools that um, maybe are helping students be warm, safe, and dry, but it has nothing to do with their learning environment, right? It, they can't see it, they can't feel it. You know, it's important to have functioning HVAC, it really is, right? It's important that the building won't flood, it really is. 
but for like the student experience or the, the teaching, the school community experience, it all looks the same. So having, going through this exercise, and I agree with Dave, I think we should go high in the sky. Let's go for the vision of what we would want. You know, if we think of school buildings as minimum 50 year buildings, what do we want from our buildings 50 years from now, right? And, and I think that it's fantastic. Thank you, Libby and Andrew, for doing this because it gives us the opportunity and we will have a direction, right? We'll have a goal so that as things like the, the planning commission works out or as potential big FEMA projects might come along, we can say like, ah, yes, and this is how we have this vision for our school district that we want to plug into this conversation. Because if they asked us right now, hey, FEMA can put $100 million towards, you know, re-envisioning downtown for flood mitigation, what does Montpelier High School want to do? what would Livy and Andrew and Jason say, right? They don't, they haven't gone through this process. So I, I super applaud it. I'm very excited. I think it's very, very cool you guys are doing this and um, you know I'll be there to help you like scrap up every piece of money I can find. <laughs> that's, Cause that's my job. <laughs> yeah. Any other final questions or comments? Yeah, I don't have too much more to add. I a lot of the same lines of what Jill just said, so I appreciate that. Um, I really appreciated the framing um, and seeing this vision. I'm really glad you, you talked about uh, spaces for neurodivergent um, and, and making sure all kids' needs are met. Um, I really appreciated thinking about um, whole child approach. I really appreciate Mia's comments around making sure we have a lot of teacher input. I think that's really important. Um, I think I'd just name a couple of things um, that I, I just would really encourage is to your point about low expectations, I really hope we, mm -hmm. we think big and think about the next 50 years. I think that's really important. Um, I, my partner and I and my eight-year-old just bought a house down the hill. We've been renting for several years and we moved closer to town. Um, I hope we have a robust discussion about merging with U32, but as someone who wants to live in a walkable community and wants um, to see my kid who's struggling right now with a lot of things, be able to walk to school the first day we moved there, that was huge. That was a big thing, it was a big deal. And so we took a little bit of a risk buying a house that the floodwaters came right up. Um, and I wanna see this community thrive. So I, I think all of these conversations do fold into one another, and I'm really excited about this. And to those low expectations, I hope we kick our needs up. I hope we tell our state and federal folks that this is what our kids need, this is what our teachers need, this is what our communities need, and it's gonna cost more money. And we need to like not shy away from those conversations as well. So. I hope. So pay attention to legislation. Yes, I hope, yes, yes. I, I hope these conversations won't just stop here, but that we really impress upon our elected officials that we need to be thinking of our schools in this way. Thank you. Yes, I think we have time for... Time for these two gentlemen back here. Related to that, I just I, I think this is sort of for you all, and it's just kind of to put it out there for the community because this surfaces in many meetings. Just a reminder to everyone that the discussion of facilities is not an academic exercise. It affects people. It affects the students in our schools today, tomorrow, next year, two years, five years from now. And so that, you know, because I think we, it's, there's a lot of short-term, long-term planning, but these students are living this stuff now. And one very specific example that I would raise when, it, when all the, in terms of when we decide what facilities we are or are not going to give our children, um, I have good knowledge that children who are being asked to share the track at Q32 are not being welcomed at a human student level in a very nice way. It's, it's, a, it's affecting them, it's playing out in people's lives because we're not providing that facility here. And I just, I just want people, like, it's not an academic exercise. It's a, I mean, yes, it's a financial, yes, it's a facility, but it's students. 
who are living their day-to-day -day lives, four years of high school, however long in middle school, I'm not going to do the math. <laughs> um, and these decisions affect them. They're affecting them yesterday, tomorrow, and it will every day along the process that we, as a community, do or do not decide to offer them these facilities. That's one example I can offer that I don't think gets factored into these discussions. Uh, I have one comment and just one quick question. Uh, it occurred to me being here tonight that although we live in a really engaged population and intelligent population that, um, and this may seem sort of rudimentary here tonight, but many people may not understand what a master planning process is, what the process is that occurs, what the desired outcome may be. Uh, and I think in order to get the most engagement and um, participation, there should be some really clear messaging on, on what, again, may seem very basic in here tonight for the rest of the population. And then my other question is really more nuts and bolts. Um, I'm just curious how much deference there is in this process uh, for the broader utility of these facilities and what, if any of them, may have reached their end of their functional lifespan uh, as a modern educational facility anyway. I think they all are beautiful buildings. They all have a lot to offer. Uh, whether or not they are a 21st century educational facility, you know, through rehabilitation or life support in some cases is a big question mark for me. Um, and I'm just curious if, if, if that's part of this master planning process is, is outlining whether or not there's a diminished return here at some point for some of these buildings. Asking big questions. Yeah. No, I, it, yes, yes, we, we will, you know, there, I, I, call, I call it like the old car conundrum, right? Like, when do you stop putting money into that old car? And buildings are different than cars, right? But it's a point where it's just like, are you throwing good money after bad? You know, that's why I was talking about, like, if, if all of the flood mitigation to make this building last through a 500-year flood, is so much money that it's just, and, and you still end up with a, an arc surrounded by water, is, it, is that the best investment of the, you know, the community's resources? Question mark, you know, because the building was built in 57 and renovated in 90 and it's, it is what it is. So I, I don't know the answer to that and it's really not even my place to say, it's really, you know, community conversation. We'll, we'll present the pros and cons and, you know, what the possibilities are, but it's really, you know, uh, like I said, it's a community conversation and decision about what's, what's the best way to, you know, spend the community's resources. So thanks, everybody, for coming. A really great conversation. Um, and um, look forward to hopefully seeing some, more, some people back for the Disney Workshop on December. Yeah. Yeah. Look at our social media and yeah. spread it on yours so that yeah. you can get more people to come. Okay, thank you.